Okay, well, welcome back to the GADMAC 2023 conference. Uh, it's brought to you by, in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Our next session is titled Cloud-Based Resource Inventory Tracking and Deployment for Exotic Disaster Response, Rescue and Recovery. And our speakers are Carrie Wittenborn, who's a project assistant at, um, at ZDR3, and David Clevin, who's the president of Animal Care Software. Thank you both to, for coming along to GADMAC and for presenting to us today. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, comments. The Zoom chat feature is disabled. So if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section and we'll try and find some time at the end to address any questions if we can. Um, we've also got the multilingual um, closed captions function available. So if you need help with translation, you can click on that function and hopefully get some translation assistance. Uh, we encourage you to use the hashtag GADMACConf in um, Twitter and any other social media and let the world know that we're out here and trying to do our best for animals and uh, people. And just as a reminder, we will be recording these sessions and they'll be available later. So without further ado, I'd really like to hand over to Carrie and to David and thank you for your presentation. All right, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm Carrie. I'm a project assistant at ZDR3, and David is off screen because he keeps going in and out. So whenever uh, I get done, I'll roll off and he can roll back in. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to be talking about the collaborative effort between uh, ZDR3 and Animal Care Software and how Zop works into that. And it's a lot of acronyms, so we'll go over what those all mean. <laughs> so this is a little bit of what we'll be talking about. And uh, the Zoological Disaster Response Rescue and Recovery, ZDR3, is the largest zoological response organization in the United States. We were uh, founded in 2020, and we'll talk a bit more history. Uh, it is an industry-led effort. We provide support to the zoos. All of the requests come specifically from the institutions that need the help. So this is me. Um, I just started at ZDR3 this past year, um, but I was involved with them from 2017. I worked at the Texas Zoo. I was a lot of different positions at that facility. And before that, I was at Texas A&M um, with the research herd. And I'll roll in here uh, from the side. Uh, so David Clevin, I'm president of Animal Care Software. Um, I did wildlife education programs for 32 years up until COVID and uh, was the past uh, education chair for Zoological Association of America and now have dedicated uh, everything that I'm doing to uh, providing tools for those that are caring for animals um, to uh, be able to manage their welfare, daily care. But we've also uh, started working with some other groups like uh, ZDR3, which is what we're gonna talk about. So uh, where does ZDR3 play into public policy? Um, lawmakers and policymakers, they do determine the allocation of resources and funding, but a lot of that is then kind of uh, made possible through um, mutual aid systems and organizations. So the National Institute or Incident Management uh, System, NIMS, actually talks about this a lot um, and how these mutual aid agreements and organizations really bridge all the gaps together. Um, interagency coordination facilitates public policy um, and the evaluation of improvement mechanisms allow for optimizing resource tracking and deployment systems, which is something that Dave will be talking about. So previous to uh, the NASOP meeting in May 2022, um, there really hadn't been a lot of discussion about um, exotic animals in the US, how that kind of works out. A lot of every everything was kind of devoted towards companion and agricultural animals. Um, and that is specifically due to the nature, the unique nature of the types of resources that are required um, for the exotic animal industry. Not everybody can go and uh, rescue a, a rhino or get a tiger out of a situation that takes a very specific set of skills and resources. Um, and zoos and aquariums have always historically handled their emergencies on their own and with little to no coordination. Um, in 2017, which we will be talking about next, um, there was a very 
obvious recognition um, that there was a need for a mutual aid organization that is specific to the exotic animal industry. So here's a little bit of the timeline. Uh, 2017, we had Hurricane Harvey. Um, and this is the ZDR3 timeline. 2018, 19, there was multiple industry meetings um, discussing the need for this mutual aid organization. Um, in January, 2020, there was a response to the Australian brush fires. Uh, 2020, we had Hurricane Laura. In 2020, we had our first ZOP grant, which brought about animal care software. Um, we had Hurricane Ida, another ZOP grant, a flood, and uh, wildfires, Hurricane Ian, California flooding, and this year we've had more. So 2017 um, was Hurricane Harvey, and that kind of changed a lot in the sense of um, exotic animal disaster rescue in the United States. Um, Hurricane Harvey was super unique. It, in the 96 hours that after it made landfall, it hardly moved. Um, it moved inwards to central Texas and dumped over 20 inches on areas as it went here in downtown Houston. This is actually after its third landfall. So you can see kind of the track here. It went in around Port Aransas. It made uh, landfall on a barrier island and then immediately made landfall on that main coastline, went into around the San Antonio region, came back out across. Um, and then once it was back over water, what it did was suck up more moisture and then it moved back up into um, East Texas and uh, Southern Louisiana and just rained and rained and rained. Uh, it was moving incredibly slow. It almost wasn't moving at all. Uh, it averaged about five miles per hour on advancement, which a lot of people walk faster than that. So um, it, was, it was very strange. Um, and in some areas it ended up dumping 60 plus inches. So these facilities were just, some facilities were inundated with water. Um, they were cut off from the areas or from their routes. Uh, so like Houston, they, they were just islands um, and then they were having to support themselves through that. And the water wasn't going down as fast as everybody thought it would. And that was mainly because it just, the, it, there was nowhere for it to go. It just kept raining and raining and the storm never moved on the way hurricanes normally do. So the fallen debris from the wind part of the storm also played a part as some rivers had their waters rerouted based from the falling trees. Um, and it was very unique for a lot of facilities that have never seen anything like this before. Some of the lessons that were learned um, was the need for that central coordination. There was a lot of people that wanted to help and everybody jumped right at the beginning and said, there's facilities that are in need, we wanna help. And this is other facilities, the public, everything, um, which led to some duplication of efforts. There was actually seven teams slash facilities that came and lended aid to two facilities in need. Um, there was very little coordination with that. And there was no central point of contact. Contact was the main thing. So there was a lot of side bar conversations going on that weren't being connected back. And um, there was some harm to facility staff and keepers. And it was really uh, evident that mental health of staff members does need to be taken into account when dealing with these kinds of disasters. So I'm going to let Dave talk about the bushfires. Yeah, and just briefly, uh, in 2020, this was before we received the, the first grant, um, uh, a couple people and uh, sitting in the front there driving on the uh, correct side of the road in Australia is my wife, Susan, and uh, she brought over resources from Austra uh, to Australia from zoological facilities here in the U.S. to the carers over in Australia. And a lot of the facilities over here were sending just uh, just a ton of like things that they thought they that the carers might need. But at some point, they was like, listen, we have a whole mountain full of pouches. We don't need any more pouches. There's a lot of other stuff that we need. So 
uh, they, the, the outcome from her responding over there was they learned that the multi, multi-agency response with communication and coordination shortfalls, they had a satellite phone, but the satellite phones, of course, if you're moving down the road, don't work very well, especially when you're trying to navigate burnt out roads and trees that could fall any time. And of course, floods that might just uh, start dropping rain on top of you in the middle of all that. And then also just the resources and donations available were not always matched with the carer's needs. And that's going to be a challenge in any disaster, you know, is finding out what people need and where, and then getting it to them. And so we learned that the resource management was going to be key in moving forward. I'll let you talk about Hurricane Laura. So then um, 2020 was our first ZDR3 response, our first official response. And it was in a whole different world because we now were dealing with COVID as well. So uh, while we had a plan on how to help a little bit better from our previous event in 2017, there was new issues that arose and new challenges. So we had two board members that led uh, teams along with four other teams from network facilities, and they provided help to two two sites. Um, This again validated the need for this type of coordination because if there wasn't a central coordinating body, it would have been just like in 2017 where everybody was eager to help, but the facilities could not, didn't know what, who to talk to, who to bring in, what the system was. Um, It also showed that there's a need for teams from a distance because in Hurricane Laura's case, all of the local facilities were blown out. They could not provide aid to their friends or to the neighboring facilities and coworkers and uh, because they were dealing with their own system at the time, as well as uh, duration of deployment. So there was teams that were on the ground for 10 days, um, which is really hard for response teams, which then created the idea of a strike team versus a task force and deciding is a strike team going to be enough to come in, take care of what needs to be done, or do we need to bring in a task force that can take care of all these different tasks that are involved with this response? And then in 2022, um, so last year we had our first really big response, which was Hurricane Ian. That's another one that validated that need for outside facilities to be able to come in and and provide aid, whether that be ground transport, air transport, and trying to uh, aid in those difficulties as well, because flying into a disaster zone is not always the easiest. And the uh, validation of a needs assessor, whenever a facility is hit like this, sometimes it's really hard for the facility to look at what they need and be able to say, here's the priorities because everything feels priority and you're almost paralyzed. Uh, So getting that needs assessor to come in, look around and say, okay, I can see you're gonna need chainsaws or what have you and contact the facilities that have those resources and bring in those specific resources. So now Dave's gonna talk a little bit about Zop Grant and how animal care software really helped in all of this. Yeah, and the rollout actually to the resource tracking system really started uh, after Hurricane Ian. So we had a few things in place, but we weren't done with the second part of the grant that would allow for um, you know truly tracking and checkout process. So you know part of these uh, grants that this came from the Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Partnership via USDA and AZ in 2020 uh, 21. Um, 20% that covered about 20% of the cost of development. Our, our organization or company covered the other 80% in the development. Um, you know, animal care software we knew was capable of handling communications and, and and like logging all that and sending out notifications to members and and it does that really well. But uh, the whole um the 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 focus of the two grants was developing the resource tracking system. You know, the funding was needed for this because um, the the capability of like the responses from kind of the domestic animal and agricultural side um, did not have a lot of the resources that were going to be needed and in a response to a zoological or exotic animal situation. And primarily, it's not just equipment, but also like training and experience of personnel. If, if a facility has venomous snakes, for instance, you, you want to be very careful that the people responding have the proper background and tools and equipment to be able to do that safely. 
Um, there were six organizations that collaborated on the requirements um, along with CDR3, and those were primarily uh, the facilities, zoos, and aquariums that were involved in the Hurricane Harvey response. And, uh, and just for anybody that's watching this, uh, this was developed here in the US, but our company has, uh, you know, we've uh, decided and dedicated that we're going to provide this platform for anybody that wants to give it a try to see if it works for your group for one year as a platform. And ZDR3 was just the first formal group to use the system. So a couple of things here that I'm just going to share with you some screenshots here towards the end to give you a rough idea of the system. But ZDR3 Command Group is modeled after Remote Federal Emergency Management Agency, kind of the Emergency Operations Center. So the incident command system, essentially. And so we're trying to make sure that we cover all the bases when it comes to communication and also the resource management. Um, ZDR3 Communication Command Post tracks events before, during, and after events. Uh, ZDR3 was active, uh, you know, for about 17 day period of tracking and deploying and demobilizing. And that doesn't even cover assistance that was provided after they'd left and demobilized to some of those facilities that were still dealing with cleanup issues. Um, but the amazing thing was their peer facilities were willing and eager to help. Um, there were over 40 facilities that offered deployment assistance during this whole operation. Uh, when there is a potential for response to an event in advance, like a hurricane, um, once that potential incident is identified, alerts are sent out to members of the incident command group and any potential response team so that they can kind of mentally be preparing that they may have to deploy. Um, it's great if they don't, but we certainly don't want to be um, moving after things. Um, it, it slows you down and it doesn't take much for everybody to just be on alert. Um, ZDR3 does monitor areas where facilities may be impacted when they have this advance notice um, through mapping, and these maps are shared with the incident command group. And of course, all this mapping program is also saved um, you know, for future reference as well. And uh, that's something we built into the software is like to be able to um, share and uh, have these mapping systems. But one thing that Carrie said that was very important is that uh, they don't just self-deploy anymore, is that uh, after the impact that ZDR3 is monitored, you know, for contact channels, and that might come through social media, weather, you know, emails, news services, uh, just being aware that there's a situation. Um, many times the government agencies may notify ZDR3 of the potential need and put them in contact with impacted facilities. But ZDR3 is only responding upon requests from the impacted facility. Um, they don't want people, uh, facilities, you know, to, to um, self-deploy unless there's uh, a request um, from these facilities. And that was a lesson that was learned at Hurricane Harvey when some facilities just self-deployed and there were already uh, there was already assistance on the ground. And sometimes they deployed and didn't have everything that they needed. And so these assessments uh, now uh, are something that they're they're trying to do. And if the the facility has the capability to do a self-assessment, that's great. But one lesson they've learned several times over and over is that often that's just not on the radar for, for the, the people on the ground because we forget that they're dealing with sometimes impacts in their personal lives as well as their facility lives. So sometimes they overestimate or underestimate their true need. And certainly they, they don't accurately identify the resources needed uh, for the mental support, which is something that ZDR3 um, does now. They deploy um, a stress management team along with um, other team members. Um, since this is an international presentation, um, we we are working on translations. We're in the final testing stages of this, and you can see this is translated into Portuguese up here because um, we want to be uh, global citizens. And so we realized when we were creating the software that we needed to make sure that it was going to work in emergencies and other places where English wasn't going to be the primary uh, language used. Um, Resource sharing and tracking. Um, so this is all by invitation. An uh, emergency organization like ZDR3 can invite network members um, to list resources that they're willing to share. The network members can manage their own resources and choose which resources they want to share. But then uh, you can see that there's a lot of like keywords used in here that allow um, in an emergency when you're trying to find what resources are needed, there's some things noted in here on some of these that say like a location, like maybe they're in a particular FEMA region um, or they have specific training. Um, I'm sorry, this uh, screen is mostly blank, but this is uh, just a membership management screen. But the idea 
is that I can see that this person is available and I can click on the details and I can see that the keywords here, that the FEMA training that this person has and what their background is, they're in the United States, they're in Texas and they're in FEMA region six. Because when they're deploying resources, they wanna make sure that they have the ability um, to deploy those resources that um, have the skills needed but also geographically or close, uh, you know, for those of you not in the United States, if you come to visit Carrie and I in Texas and you want to come visit us, well, you better tell us where you plan on landing your plane because you could be uh, 10 or 12 hours from where we actually are located. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the teams that deployed in Hurricane Ian drove for 18 plus hours to get there. Yeah, 18 plus hours. But the other aspect on this page here especially when you're deploying resources that are personnel or team members is the emergency contact information. So if something happens to them, you have a way of getting hold of somebody that can help. And all this keyword that allows you to search for needed resources in an emergency, um, that's managed by the organization. They can um, create these uh, keywords. Most, More importantly, they can assign them after the fact. So here in the US, uh, members are not always going to know what uh, what FEMA codes maybe apply to those resources. So uh, ZDR3, for instance, could add them afterwards. But this sharing was a very important component. So one thing that uh, with our software, if someone's using it, is that a facility, a member can actually enter all the resources that they have at their facility that they're keeping track of, which is helpful um, for like in the example where they have to, uh, you know, um, uh, evacuate fish so you know what resources you have for yourself but then they may choose to let the, the uh, organization like zdr3 share and that's what this enable resource sharing is it means i can choose to share certain resources so this is kind of like a you know just a, a brief overview of the resource tracking it's very dynamic i think it's one of the first of its kind uh, that i've seen and i've been involved now for several years in like kind of like learning about resource management. And when we went to the national conference here in the US back in May of uh, last year, I think it was, NASAP, um, that most of the resource management even was still kind of being done either through FEMA or, for, uh, or through just like phone calls and emails. This is a system that allows uh, you to have a good overall view of all the resources available and then do checkouts of that. And there's a whole request and checkout process. So I know that uh, we wanted to try and get you all back on time and we're probably a little bit over here. So that being said, um, uh, certainly Carrie and I are available for questions uh, You know, after if we have time, if not, uh, you can contact us. But with the information, with the formation of ZDR3 and its network members, zoos and aquariums no longer must handle emergencies on their own. Um, through grants distributed by the Zoo Aquarium All Hazards Partnership, ZAP, funded by AZ and USDA, um, animal care software, we've created a cutting edge resource management tool specific to animals affected by disasters and emergencies. And this is, we did not create this just for the exotic animals, by the way. Um, we really hope that those that are dealing with companion animals and agricultural animals can find uses of it well. So that's our contact information. And uh, thank you for letting us present. Um, and by the way, to all the presenters that have gone before us, Carrie and I have been uh, following along and we're really enjoying all the presentations and learning a lot from them. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David and Kerry. Um, you have the best QR code, I have to say, one with the tail on. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, thanks for, for keeping us to time. That's fantastic. I think we are a little bit short for questions. Um, I haven't got anything coming up at the moment. If anyone's got anything they want to ask um, fairly quickly, just you can put that in for us. Um, it was great to see the, um, you know, the, 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 the interface you have there. It looks very um, user friendly uh intuitive um and comprehensive as well so uh congratulate you on, on the design of that it looks extremely usable which is which is great and a resource that um i'm sure people will be keen to use and get get working with and and thanks for helping us out in australia with uh with the bushfire sort of side of things because uh it, it was a it was a horrendous season certainly for anybody who was involved in that and of course with the animals as well um i have, do have a question in the q a so actually please bear with me while i just open that up um, I've got a question here which says, are you part of the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster um, here in the US? Uh, 
So ZDR3 is plugged into NASAP and the, the acronym always escapes me. There's a lot of letters there. As a matter of fact, there's more letters than the acronym even indicates there. Um, they have gotten plugged into the kind of national response network now. And, uh, and as far as animal care software, we've primarily been working here in the U.S. because that's where the grant and funding was coming from. But uh, that was one of the motivations for me uh, submitting a presentation is during, uh, during the bushfires, we made the software free for any carers that wanted to use it as a platform or any veterinarians responding or anybody at all. Um, and, but, you know, how do you make a, a lot of people aware that there's something out there? And so I just hope that this brings awareness that there are tools, that there are people that are trying to develop, you know, the things that will help in emergency disasters. Because, you know, and, and as clearly we've seen so far, it's not just natural disasters, it's political disasters, it's, you know, it's environmental disasters. And so, you know, I, I don't see this as being just like fitting for one particular situation. Yeah, definitely all hazards. And I think the other thing that's really nice on the Gadamac front is I know we had a great um, presentation at the, the the last sort of conference. And so I assume that this is sort of interrelated to some of, um, of what we were being told about a couple of years back. So that's great. Um, the cost issue has been a question that someone's asked here. I don't know if it's something you want to handle here or or separately. So um, they just said, uh, what would the cost be after the first year? I don't know if you're happy to give an indication of that at this point. Well, that's that's a good question, and, and that we don't want to prevent anybody from being able to use it. So so far, our model has been to uh, kind of do like the the donation uh, suggested donation kind of thing is to work with organizations to see how we can make it happen and see if that funding doesn't develop later. Because even ZDR three didn't have funding initially, and so they're just now in the process of getting their funding. So let's just say that we're very flexible. So don't let that question be uh, you know prohibitive for reaching out and learning more. Yeah, no, that definitely sounds like a good opportunity to ask more questions and, uh, and, and go direct. So thank you so much for taking those questions. Thanks for the presentation.